בעזרת השם ובלילוי נשמעת בן ציון בן סוריה and אסתר בת סוריה and also לילוי נשמת ריטה מזל בת כסייה and להבדיל לרפואה דבורה אלישבע בת שרה ברוך השם today uh, we going to finish the, the series way of השם that's going to be lecture uh, number nine less than what I thought. I thought maybe it would be 11, 12 lectures, but Hashem will be finished today. As you know, uh, to refresh your memory, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato, the Ramchal, passed younger than 40, and he wrote more than 100 books, which almost all of them were gone. The few that we have left made a huge impact on the world, and so many things we know is thanks to him we would not have been able to know all these things and Baruch Hashem that had mercy on us that some of this precious book survived and uh, taught us so much of what we know. Before I start, I just want to make one announcement to refresh your memory. From time to time I would like to remind about this important legendary book, Welcome to Judaism. This book obviously helps a lot of uh, convert to learn the foundation and the basics of Judaism. If you have a good base, everything else follows. It was translated to four different languages. You have it in Hebrew, Russian, Spanish, and English. It's uh, printed on a very, very fine paper, the most uh, precious paper with beautiful pictures, with explanation, teach everything you need. And Today, believe it or not, Jews needed just as much as non-Jews. I mean, 30, 40 years ago, maybe it would meant for Gentiles. Now, the level of the Jews, the secular Jews who wants to become religious and wants to come closer to, to religion is so low that I promise you that not one of them knows 1% of what's written in this book. Better than that. We had one Hasid, Hasid, religious from birth, all his life, who once did a favor to us to store the books in his storage. He asked me, can I read one? I said, of course. A few days later he told me, listen, this book already changed my life. There are things over here I never knew in my whole life. So <laughs> if someone who grew up ultra, ultra Orthodox didn't know most of the things here, that means it's mandatory for every Jew. Must be in every house. Also, if someone wants to help uh, publishing and spreading many books, please contact me. I will direct you with the author, Rabbi Golan, and he can get a special, very, very low cost to publish thousands of the books, Bezrat Hashem, or even hundreds. You have them in Israel, also in Hebrew, and Baruch Hashem, a lot of soldiers getting it. And Bezrat Hashem, we will try to get it into the education system in Israel. As you know, as much as the anti-religion, hopefully with Hashem's help, eventually we'll be able to push it in now when we have a, a better government. So that's the announcements for today. Last lecture, we finished by explaining the mitzvah of Kriyat Shema that a Jew has to say every morning and every evening and also before he goes to bed, three times a day basically, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. The meaning of this verse is, listen Israel, God is our master and God is one. Right away, this verse that is so important in the Torah and in Judaism disqualify Christianity immediately because they made another entity, or two more entities, right away it's against one of the most important verses in God's book. You don't need to be a genius to understand right away that what they preach and what the Torah says is completely different. But we don't really care right now about what they teach, we care about the original book of God, and over here it's a very important mitzvah, by saying it, a Jew accept on himself the kingdom of the master of universe. As the Torah said that Hashem chose us, the Jewish people from all the nation, to be his children. So we are 
partially his children and partially his servant. But there is a difference between a regular servant that serves his boss to a servant that serves God. The difference is a servant that serves the boss is because the boss is needy, he needs certain things, and he needs someone to help him with what he needs to get done. So the servant completely is for the sake of his master. When in the Torah is the exact opposite. The entire service that a servant, meaning a Jew, is doing is not for the sake of God. Is 100% for the sake of himself and the sake of his children. As it's written many times in the Torah, that you and your children should benefit for eternity. And every one of what you do is 100% for yourself. I don't need anything from you. I'm perfect with you, without you, before the world was made, after the world will be finished. I'm always going to be the highest level of you know, perfect God and I don't need anything to become better. I'm always in the highest level possible. And you cannot decrease or increase anything when it comes to me. So all these rules and the system over here is only for yourself. As the Ramchal explained in this book, as we started in the first, in the second lecture, explaining the purpose of the creation, also in the other series I made about the path to the just, Mesilat Yesharim, also in the first chapter, the Ramchal explained the purpose of the creation and the purpose of the human being. And why this world is actually a preparation for the next world, which is eternity. And the next world is going to be determined based on the achievement that we're going to achieve in this life. Meaning, if we follow the rules and regulation, we're going to benefit greatly. And if we're going to ignore it or rebel against it, we're going to pay a very massive price, which is going to be very painful. Some of us, since we do good and bad, most people do good and bad, not just bad or not just good, we will have to go through a series or a period of time of cleanup, which we're going, the soul is going to be clean once we die, and it's going to be very painful, but it's going to have a limit. Meaning after X amount of years, we're going to be purified and then go to heaven and receive the reward for all the good we did. Some of us, unfortunately, will not get to that period, will not be able to be purified, and God forbid would lose their share to the world to come. So it's all depend on what sins and what crimes a person commit against the creator of the world. Also, don't forget that we learn also that every transaction in life, every word and every thought of a person make an impact on the entire world. It's similar to what the scientists explain about the butterfly effect. When the butterfly moves his wing, nobody feels anything in the room. You're going to have a butterfly flying here for an hour. Is he going to make any difference in the room? We won't see anything. But this little wave that is creating right now is going to travel and travel and gain more and more and more until it can turn into a storm. It's hard for us to understand how it works, but we see that little transaction eventually can turn to a huge impact on the creation. Same thing when we speak bad things next to raw material. Same thing when we eat things that we're not supposed to eat. Same thing we speak words of heresy, words that God hates, and makes an impact on our soul and our future and the entire creation. That's why many, many times in the past I said that even in the raw material, such as a table, a chair, anything that you have in a house, it's also absorbing everything that we are doing in every day's life. 
and it makes an impact on the blessing of the house, or God forbid, the other way, which is the opposite of blessing. Top. So the Ramchal conclude, and that's what we, that's where we end last week, that. Uh, the Creator wanted all the things that were created to be connected to Him and dependable on Him all the time. In every possible aspect, with no exception to the rule. Every raw material cannot exist without interference of God. Every human being cannot breathe a second without interference from God. Every transaction in a creator in a creation cannot happen without the energy that he keeps supplying and without his consent. Meaning if a person is about to do something that's going to make a very big damage to a nation, he always has the right to overrule this choice and dismiss it interfering with a person's uh, with a person's free will even though god hates very much to interfere with people's choices because in the end he judge every one of them for good and for bad therefore the judge is not interfering with the criminal's action until he's being judged but while he's doing whatever he does the judge is not interfering with his choices once he comes in front of the judge he has to pay or to get rewarded for what he have done However, when it relates to the benefit or destruction of a big amount of people, such as a nation, such as a whole city, such as a whole country, such as a whole world, that's when God may take the right to interfere and dismiss whatever the person wanted to do. To make it easier to understand, if Adolf Hitler, Imach Shimon, that wanted to kill millions of Jews, if God did not agree that the Jews deserve to get such a tragedy, obviously he would never succeed. The fact that we know today that he succeeded in his mission, or a large portion of his, of his plan, that means, unfortunately, that we did things that got Hashem so upset at us, and in the end, this is what we got. There are also other examples such as the destruction of the temple, first temple, second temples, all kinds of pogroms, all the sufferings we get from the Arabs and other nations, all of that could, have, could not have happened without God's energy, without him giving the authority to certain uh, Gentiles or leaders to do what they want to do. Obviously, without him, none of that would have happened. Not, not that the people that did it will not get what they deserve because they chose to do evil, but in the end, the evil they wanted to do needed the approval of God. And that's not only when it comes to Jews, when it comes to every nation. Two nations wants to start a war, and like Russia and Ukraine. If God did not think the Ukrainians deserve to be destroyed, the Russians will never succeed. Something would happen and the war would never start or would stop after a day or two. The fact that it's going on and on and on and more and more bombs are falling on their heads, every one of these bombs were approved by God. And every person that gets saved was approved by God. And every person that died or got injured is approved by God. Everything is approved. It doesn't mean the Russians will not get the punishment for certain things they do. But this is the way the creation works. When one person wants to do bad to another person, if the other person deserves it, God would make the criminal succeed. Such a thief. He wants to steal. If you don't deserve to lose, there are two options right now. Either the alarm will go off and he gets scared or the police will pass by, or he won't be able to break the lock. All of a sudden he'll get dizzy and he wouldn't be able to perform a robbery. And then you get saved. Or he would succeed, but you, the police will catch him a day or two and return to you everything he stole. That also can happen. Or he won't be caught and you would lose certain things in a robbery, and uh, two months later, God will give you a great client into the store that was not a part of the plan for your income, 
And that customer will give you the $10,000 that the thief stole two months ago. You obviously don't see the connection, but if you clean, if you're not a thief, if you're not a mechalel Shabbat, if you don't charge interest from Jews, if you don't deceive clients, if you don't lie and cheat in a the business, there's no reason for you to lose money. If you did lose money, it's guaranteed to return to you. Why? Because you're innocent. There's no reason for you to lose. If you are a criminal and a, and a crook, it's very, very possible that this is only a part of what you need to lose. Now, I want to remind you, when, when a thief lose money, let's say he steals a lot of money, and then all of a sudden he invests money by someone like Bernie Madoff, and he steals all his money. So people would say he got what he deserved. He stole overall a million dollars from his clients in the last 20 years, and Madoff took it all. Here you go. So he got what he deserved. That's an understatement. This million is not the punishment yet. It's just taking what's not yours. That's not a punishment. If I grab this phone and someone else came and grabbed it from me by force, you cannot say that I was punished because the phone was taken away from me. It was never my phone to begin with. That's not the punishment. The punishment will be in five minutes when the police will arrest me and put me in jail for two weeks until the trial. And then whatever the judge decides, that will be the punishment. Taking away the stolen good is not the punishment. Some people say, oh, thank God the money is lost. I wasn't so honest in the business before I became religious. It's good God took it away from me. At least I got what I deserve. That's not the punishment. It's a big mistake. A lot of people make this mistake. That's not the punishment. That's just taking what's not yours. The punishment is still waiting. Unless the person repents. And of course, that's not the topic right now. So, Kriyat Shema is Kabbalat Ol Malchut Shamayim. I accept the ruling of God. The more people follow God's instruction, the more people love Him and care about Him and listen to Him and follow His rules, the more respect He gains. You don't want a king that has 20 followers. If the king has only 20 followers in the whole country, what does it tell you about that king? Miserable king. What happens if it's 200? A little bit better. 2,000, even better. 20,000, even better. 2 million, much better. So the more people follow the king, the more honor the king gets. That's why we have a rule in the, the laws of prayers that if you have a minyan, a synagogue that have 10 people, 11, 12, barely have a minyan. You need 10 people minimum to start praying together in a group. So they barely have a minyan, or you have a shul with 500 people, and both of them are in a normal distance from your house. You can either go to the 12 people, or you can go to the 300, or to the, to the 1,000 people in a synagogue. Where, which minyan is more respectable? The one with hundreds of people. The more people are there, the more honor the king gets. With one exception to the rule that if the 11, 12 people may not have even 10 and you're going to be the 10th one, then it's a bigger mitzvah. Because without you, they couldn't pray together. They couldn't say Kaddish, they couldn't take out the Torah, you need 10 people. So if they need the 10th one to complete to 10, better to go there and complete the minyan. But if they have minyan without you, let's say 20, 30 people, and then you have 300, you should aim to the 300. Only if it's just as much kosher like the small shul. Meaning, if this is a place that people speak in the middle of davening, or the women come, they're not modest, or the mechitza, the separation, is not kosher like here when they close the curtain, nobody can see the women. Some synagogues are not kosher. It's too low, or it's clear, or it has holes. And they obviously can see the women, and some of the guys, instead of praying, they're looking for shiduch. You know, in the middle of davening. That's not a kosher place. Or, if the rabbi over there doesn't speak words of encouragement or speak heresy, unfortunately, like some places have, 
or he's too modern, or he modified the truth of the Torah. So a place like this, you're not allowed to step in, such as reform, or conservative, or ultra-modern orthodox. You're not allowed to go to such places. The prayers over there is a waste of time. Not only they are not productive, they are destructive. Why? Because what kind of, uh, what kind of holiness this place has? Zero holiness. Only get Hashem upset and angry. However, if the minyan is a lot of people and everyone came to pray and there's good speeches there and nobody speaks and people dress respectfully and all of that, then you should always go for a bigger quantity, you know, quantity and quality. So Rabotai, uh, everything in a creation has to be connected to Hashem. By us practicing his laws, we are admitting that he's the king and he's the creator, which is a big thing. It's a very big thing in your actions to, learn, to teach the world who is God, how he made the world. And obviously when, when the Goim see how you behave, like you observe the Sabbath, immediately they come to ask questions. And then you begin to explain to them why you strike on the seventh day because God also did the same. And they begin to ask questions about God and you publish the ruling of the great God to the world and everyone become closer to that God thanks to your action and to your words. So that's called Kiddush Hashem. Sanctify the name of Hashem. And Kriyat Shema when you do Kriyat Shema, besides having intention in the words, Shema Israel, listen Israel, Hashem Elokeinu, God is our master and God is one and there's no other. You have to also think, before you say Baruch Shem Kvod Malchuto Leolam Vaed, you have to think for, for a second or two that now you are being executed, that the Goim the Nazis or the Romans or any one of those evil people, they're about to chop your head off and you're willing to give your life for the sake of heaven. Not to bow down to an idol, not to commit any crime that is forbidden. You're willing to give your entire life, your entire money, everything you have just for the sake of this God. That's a very, very high level. And if you do it all the time, eventually, it will count in the eyes of God that you actually practice such a test. That they're about to execute you unless you bow down to an idol or admit in a fake religion and you refuse to do so and they killed you. That's a very high level to die on Kiddush Hashem. Since it never happened to you, it's only in your imagination. But if you're willing to accept such a thing like Rabbi Akiva and Hana and Shivat Banea and some other heroes, it will count like it actually happened. It's very interesting. Because it didn't really happen. And probably if it would happen in reality, you will chicken out and you would not give your life. And you, God forbid, maybe you would bow down to the idol to save your life right now. Because you don't want to die young. But the fact that you're thinking, they're about to chop my head off and I'm dying for the truth, being a proud Jew, not selling my own, only one God, and not giving up my faith, that's a very high thing. That's called Kabbalat Ol Malchut Shamayim. The Ramchal continue, all of that has other things that are born from it, like, ch like children. You have the parents and then children and then grandchildren, things are continue to be reborn. We have the rules and the laws of creation, everything in the right order. And all the things in the creation praise Hashem. The angels, the animals. There is a whole book, Perek Shira. Every animal has a certain praise to Hashem. There are people that praise Hashem. The angels in the upper world that praise Hashem. Everything in the creation was made for His honor. As we said in the tefillah, Baruch Elokeinu Sheberahanu Lichvodo. Bless be God that created us for the sake of his honor. That's an unbelievable praise. Many people don't think. Meaning who God is proud of. Like a person has many children. 
One of them is extremely proud of. He always showing him, always taking him with him to places. The other ones he hides. That one is his diamond. He always talks about him. When people want to see what kind of children he has, he makes sure he will be the first one. If someone asks him, send me pictures of your children, he is the only one he sends. Everybody, after a while, understand that that child is different than all the others. This is what God said to the Jewish people. You are my children. You are my pride. You represent me in the world. Make sure you do not insult me. Make sure you do not embarrass me. Make sure you don't make me regret for choosing you to be my son. If the secular Jews would only know that, maybe they would think twice before they're about to rebel against him every day of their life. Some of them have no idea what they live for. It's a little bit too much to talk to them about representing God in a creation. First, teach them what, that they are different than monkeys, because in their eyes, all they want is physical pleasure. Every one of them think, the purpose of life is to eat, to drink, to have intimacy, and to enjoy life, and swimming, and sport, and whatever brings me physical pleasure. More than that, there's nothing else in their life. That's why everyone is striving for pleasure. Everyone, the whole world is around that word, pleasure. That's what everybody's looking for. People that are spiritual, they also like pleasure. It's normal. But they know that it's forbidden to be addicted to this kind of life meaning all the shopping and jewelry and vacations and cars and all this nonsense. If it becomes the main thing in their life, their life is entire failure. If here and there they get some physical pleasure, it's no problem. It's actually healing, meaning too much, too much all your life, God forbid, it can break. You need from time to time to feed your evil inclination with something, meaning it gives you some new energy. That's why in life you need breaks. You do something you enjoy very much, but you need break between. If it would be constant, it would lose the purpose. And that's what a lot of people unfortunately don't understand. Remember this verse, Baruch Elokeinu Sheberaanu Lichvodo. Blessed be God that created us for the sake of his honor. Vivdilanu Mina Toim and separated us from all the mistaken nations and gave us an eternal Torah, his Torah. And he planted in us life of eternity, full of highest level of spiritual pleasure. And who got it? The Jewish people. And what 70, 80 percent of them are busy imitating the lowest people in the creation. People that are worse than animals in their behaving. Remember, animals, they may behave ugly, but none of them is a criminal. An animal, a lion that murdered right now a zebra, brutally, with horrible cruelty, it's not a, it's not a criminal. You shouldn't hate him. You have nothing against him in your heart. If you do have, you're a fool. He's a robot. He's hungry, and this is the way he was programmed to run after anything he can eat. People that murder, they are criminals. They didn't need to murder. Animals that murder, they're innocent. There's no action taken against them ever. Some people in this world are much worse than animals. They imitate certain things the animals do, but the animals are not guilty and they are very guilty. So sometimes comparing wicked people to animals, it's actually a compliment, not an insult. Meaning the animals are much better than them. you giving them too much credit. When you speak about gay people who do horrible things and rebel against the law of nature and the laws of God and make him very upset, comparing them to animals is a big insult to the animals and a very big compliment to the gays. Because animals don't behave like that. Why you compare them to animals? Animals live according to the rules of nature, male and female. 
some animals, they live among wicked people and the actions of the wicked people make an impact in the entire creation, as I said before. It makes an impact. That's why in San Francisco, they found animals that are also gay. The reason they are like that is because the impurity of the wicked people that live in San Francisco. And in Tel Aviv, if you had uh, animals, meaning safari, probably you would find the same phenomena. Why is it? Because they brainwash every child. Kids younger than Bar Mitzvah already come with a flag. I came out of the closet. When did you have time to go into the closet, you little fool? What do you even know about life, Bichlal? That you already make statements and they put you on the news, all these liberal, wicked, despicable people, with no shame. They brainwash the, the, the brains of children in Israel, non-stop. Hear the same thing. Change your sex. Yeah, no, it's okay. Wow, we're so proud of you that you're gay. What does he know, Bichlal, about gay? Who gave him this idea? All day, Netflix, Disney, Disney, Six years old kids watch men kiss men. This is cartoons of today. There's no shame. The liberal wicked people took over the world just like the Zohar told us they will. But the Zohar also told us what will be their horrible end in the end. And when we know that, at least we have a comfort that all these wicked people that fight God will get exactly what they deserve. It may take time, we need patience. I know we don't have patience. We want things to happen in our life right away, in our private life and in general as the Jewish nation. The righteous people wants to see justice. But in this world, it's very difficult to see the divine justice. Unless you're in a very high level of spirituality, Hashem will show you the justice. Ordinary people, they suffer from God hiding himself in a creation. And why does he hide himself in a creation? This is what the Ramchal is about to explain right now. All of these things that we dis discussed, the Ramchal said, is the actions of the people are admitting and testifying about the Creator and everything he created. When the people follow his instructions, it brings peace to the world, happiness to the world, and blessing to the world. The blessing multiplies. The peace becomes greater and greater. When the servant decides to rebel against the king, and they do not surrender and put their pride and ego down, and declare a war in their action, in their, war, in their speech, and in their behavior, they actually go against the rules of the creator of the world, against his book, against his ideology. The good slowly, slowly disappear from the world, and the darkness become bigger and greater, and the evil take over, and all of these things in a creation later goes up to the spiritual heaven, make an impact, and reflects back to the world to bring more evil. Meaning, it's a two-way street. You will go against me right here. It will be sent to the upper world, will be reviewed, will be analyzed and will return back to the world as more destruction, more pandemics, more financial crisis, more racism and hate and people killing each other, more rapes, more horrible, despicable actions of so many wicked people. It goes two ways. If you won't fix things over here, the reflection from up there will not be any greater. First, you have to fix things over here, and that's when you're gonna see a much better reflection to the world or to the country where you live. But, what we need to understand when it relates to us, that there will be a day 
that the creator of the world will reveal himself to humanity. That's what we say every day when we pray, Bayomahu, Hashem Echad, Ushmo Echad. At that day will be one God with one name. No one will ever dare to talk another, about an, another word about another fake religion and cult. And not only that, the world will come to a perfect correction. That's why we say, Letaken Olam Bemalchut Shaddai. The world will be fixed in the kingdom of Hashem. And a lot of good will be attracted to the creation. And peace. Peace of mind and peace in general. And a lot of greatness to all the creations. And lots of spiritual light. And lots of, impurity, uh, lots of purity instead of the impurity. And all the good will multiply and grow. And all the bad will shrink and defeated to nothing. And they won't be able anymore to destroy the world as they are right now. Right now, every second they're destroying the world in every place you go. As of now, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is hiding himself in a creation and does not rule with full power yet because of the actions and the choices of the people, which unfortunately the vast majority of them are very wicked. So the evil is in control, and all the things that are born from that evil continue to spread in a world like cancer. And that's why the world is in such a horrible shape. He wrote this 250 years ago, when the world was about a million times better than today. Not a thousand times better, a million times better than today. In his days, no one would dare to say that he's gay. You wouldn't find one gay in a whole country. No one would walk naked in the street like uh, animals walk with no clothes and brag about the mental disease that they have and try to convince everyone that we are not normal. They are the normal. No one would do it in his days. In his day, no woman in the world will ever dare to come out to the street unless she cover fully, Jew and non-Jew. Also the Gentiles. In his time, when a person bought merchandise and he said, I'm going to pay you tomorrow by 2 p.m., 99.999% of the time would, would happen with a handshake, without contracts and lawyers and more security codes and this and that, identify yourself, without all this nonsense. I can talk from now until next year about how much greater the world was in his days compared to today. So just imagine if we live today, how much more you would have to write here. But we got the general rule. The world is today in a total bankruptcy in every aspect. Everywhere you go, it's a total disaster. So it will come to an end. The question is how many people will pay the price? How many people will survive to see the end? How many people would live in those perfect days after the Messiah would come and the resurrection of the dead and all the evil people would be vanished? That would be a great honor to live with King David, with King Solomon, with Rabbi Akiva, with Moses, with Joshua, with all these legends. We now are just reading about them. We can only imagine how holy they were and how they look. We will have an opportunity to stand next to them and even take a selfie with them. If you would have a kosher phone, of course. <laughs> so we get the idea here. I don't know which one is a greater reward. To survive and see all the legend, all the holy people that we read about them in the Tanakh, or to see the payback to all the wicked liberals that declare the war every second of their life in, against God and humanity. I don't know which one is a greater gift. Some people will enjoy more to see all the righteous people and the fact that they survive. Some people will enjoy more to see the revenge that God will give to all the wicked people, Jews and non-Jews. If you think right now, which one of the two I would be? It's probably what you're thinking, right? right? Normally. And if you came to the conclusion 
that you want to survive more to see the end of the wicked people than to see that you actually survive with all the righteous people. Don't feel bad about it. Why? King David already wrote about it in Psalms. We read it every morning in a tefillah, in the prayers. El nekamot Hashem, el nekamot ofia. Inase shofet al goyim, right? Inase shofet haaretz, ashev gemul al goyim. Translation. God is the God of revenge. The God of revenge will show up one day. For what? What's the purpose of that day? In Asesh of Etaretz, the king of universe will be lifted up to his place that he deserved to be. How it's going to happen? By destroying all the wicked people. Ashev Gemul al Geim. So there is nothing Hashem is waiting for more than the day that he will pay back to all the Nazis and all the Hamas and all the Hezbollah and all the gays and all the liberals and Bernie Sanders and his friends. There is nothing he waits for more than this. It's written in Tehillim, it's not my words. The question is why he's not doing it right now. What is he waiting for? That's what we are now talking about. The Ramchal explained. So, people that rebel against the Torah, against the religion, hate religion, hate rabbi, hate morality, hate ethics, hate all of that. Or even if they are following the religion, but they're just racist. It's also a very big crime. Why you hate this Jew? Because he's black. Why you hate him? Because he's white. Why you hate him? Because he's a convert. Why you hate her? Because she's like this. What is this? Where does it say that you even have a permission to even think like that? Forget about to act like that. There is no permission. Aiding someone because God created him in a certain image, that's already a very big crime. And by the way, it's a very, very big stupidity. Very big stupidity. Someone smart will disrespect a person because he's ugly, let's say. What is it his fault? That's how God designed him. Telling him, I hate you because you look like that, or you look like that, or because you're short, or because you're too tall, or oh, whatever, or you're excellent, or you're born in this country, obviously it shows that you are an empty vessel. You yourself are empty. Someone that is full and happy in his life would respect anyone. Why you respect everyone? Why wouldn't I? If Hashem created him and gave him life, and he still wants him around, there's a reason for it. I know better than God what's good and what's bad. That's his business. I follow what the Torah allowed. The Torah allowed to discriminate wicked people. Not to discriminate white or black or rich or poor or smart or stupid. No. To discriminate wicked people who goes with their actions against God. It's mitzvah to discriminate them. You don't want to be affiliated with them, you don't want to marry them, you don't want to support them in any way. That's what the halacha requires. So by you showing empathy to wicked people, you actually yourself join the rebel against God. And that's what a lot of nice Jews that are trying to love everyone, they don't understand. There is mitzvah to love certain people, there is mitzvah to hate certain people. Who is the only one that allowed to say who to love and who to hate? The one that created all people. Not me, not him, not her, not no, anyone. We are not the decision makers. The Torah say that certain people has mitzvah to hate. For instance, someone who every one of his actions is against religion. It's mitzvah to hate him. If you find his lost item on the street, the Torah say you're not allowed to waste time returning it to him. Keep it. What about stealing? I dismiss you from stealing. Don't waste a minute on this wicked person. Don't wait three days searching for him. Where is this guy? I want to return his, his wallet. He lost it. Ah, but if it's a kosher Jew, Shomer Shabbat, honest, decent. I mean, no one is perfect. 
But in general, religious person, you have to search in the whole world until you, lo you, t you return the lost object to him. Even among Gentiles, a regular Gentile that is not an idol worshiper and not a Nazi, meaning not a racist, there's no permission to aid him. Actually, you have to love and respect him. Rabbi Chaim Vital writes it. If he's an idol worshiper, not only you're allowed to hate him, you must hate him. And his mitzvah to make fun of him. That's the rule. And again, I didn't write the rules. Mitzvah, it's written in the Talmud. The more fun you make at them, the more reward you're going to get. You're going to make fun at the kosher rabbi, immediately you lose your share to the world to come. There is no remedy to your punishment. That's what the Gemara says. There is no remedy to his punishment. However, if you made fun at some idol worshiper, put a big statue and bow down and kiss his feet, that's a very big mitzvah. Hashem is going to get you a huge reward. So you see, the whole Torah in life is discipline. There are time to love, there is time to hate. There is time to give, and there is time not to give. There is time to be extra righteous, and there is time to observe, to observe just to see. Everything in life is a matter of amount and timing. Sometimes it's permitted. Now, next week is not permitted. It's Passover, you can't eat bread. Right now it's mitzvah on Shabbat. Next week it will be a very big sin to eat bread. Why? The same bread. Today it's a great mitzvah. Next week it's a cut for the soul. Why? It's all about timing. I'm educating you to control yourself. I'm educa educating you not to be a role. I love everyone. You're a criminal. You love everyone? You know these liberals? I can't stand when they talk their nonsense. It gives me goosebumps. We love everyone. Oh yeah, you love the Nazis? Oh no, they killed our grandparents. So, why you love the Hamas but you hate the Nazis? Because the Nazis killed your grandparents. Hamas killed his grandparents. What's the difference? No, we're pro-Palestinian. Why? Because you're stupid brainwashed. That's what they teach you in the university. You never think. You never think. Now in Israel, there's a perfect example. They want to pass a law that you're not allowed to wave with Palestinian flag in the universities of Israel. Half of the students, students are terrorists, either Arab terrorists or lefty liberals who join together with them to destroy Israel and to kill Jews. They make demonstrations in the university. In the United States, you're not allowed to wave a flag of terrorism. If you will come with the Al-Qaeda flag, you will be arrested. If you come with the Nazi flag, you'll be arrested. But in Israel, they want to, the lefty, in Machshimam, there's such reshaim among this Erev Rav, you have to see how they fight that these murderers will be able to walk in Tel Aviv with the Palestinian flag. And when the government wants to pass a law, all the heads of the university are screaming like you want to kill their child. Don't expect us to force the law on our student. Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech that people declare that they want to kill us? That's freedom of speech? Words become action every day. What? Don't see what they do. They don't care. That's what you see. Nothing here makes sense. They're going to kill your own children, you fool. Who are you demonstrating for? If you fall in the hand of the Hamas, liberal, not liberal, lefty, righty, do you think they care? They see your name is Levy or Cohen or Rosenberg, they'll slaughter your, your neck in a second. Do you think they're going to care that you demonstrated for them when you were in the university? You're really that stupid? How many lefties they already killed un until now? The answer is, it's not even in their end. They're so wicked that everything Hashem loves, they hate, automatically. That's why they can come and support Hamas, and a minute later support the gays. How does it go together? I don't understand. An hour ago, you're waving the, the gays flag. We want gays to be in charge and to give them rights, and everyone support them. And an hour later, he waves with the Hamas flag. 
Hamas wants to slaughter all the gays. How in one hour he demonstrates for two that they are the total opposite of each other? The answer, don't look for logic. I hate God, and whatever he loves, I hate. So he hate gays, I love gays. He hate Hamas murderers, I love Hamas murderers. That's it. Even if it's contradiction, what do you expect me to, to, to explain to you why I'm contradicting myself? No. Everything automatically that it's mitzvah, I hate. And everything that it's a sin, I love. And don't look for logic. Don't look for logic. And that's how it goes. So the Ramchal said, so as of now, until the day will come that God will finally show up and start putting things in the right order here, the evil of all the people in the world will multiply and spread and spread like cancer and more bad would come. And that's how it goes. You should know that the darkness, the spiritual darkness in the world is also limited. There is a set line that God made that up to this line, it can still grow. If you would pass this line, the world will be destroyed. For instance, in Egypt, the Jewish nation had to live today. Quickly, quickly. There's no time for the, for the bread to rise, for the dough. Hurry up, we're living in an hour. What happened? We we'll live tomorrow in the daylight. Why in the night? If you stay here another three, four hours, you will never be able to come out of it. You already reached the 49th level of impurity. Mem tet share tuma. If you will reach the 50th, from there, there is no recovery. Similar to a drug addict. When he smokes grass, there is a chance he will come out of it. When he takes certain pills, there's a chance he's going to come out of it. Even cocaine, much harder, but there's a chance that it will come out of it. But this fentanyl that he's going to start taking, which is, I don't know, 100 times stronger than heroin, if he started with that, you know he's done. It's just a matter of time until he dies. So from there, there's no return. So everybody knows. Why are you putting effort in this drug addict and not in this one? Because this one is a lost case. There's nothing I can do about it. This one we can still save. Same thing over here. This wicked person we can still save. There's a small chance, but there is a chance. This one, like Bernie Sanders, there's no chance to save him. God will not allow. Why he did so much bad, why would you let him get away with that? The chance to save someone like that is one to a billion. But there is a lot of other Jews that are wicked, but they are really more mistaken than wicked. If you see two, three, four hours with them, they may begin to rethink. Today I got an email from an electrician in Israel. He said, Rabbi, I'm now in a house of a judge in a court in Haifa. I do an electric job in his house. Since it's a full day job, we had conversation. It's a very liberal lefty judge. But unlike others, is handling a conversation. I'm in his house, he asks questions, and I even see that some of the things I told him, what I learned from your lecture, made impression on him. Which film you suggest I should let him watch? He agreed to watch. Well, of course, Torah Umada, Torah and Science. That's what I thought. Will this judge become religious? Probably not. It's too much for him to give up. Judge, I won't bow down to him, he rules life and death. You know how they are. But maybe he will be less of a hater of Torah and rabbis. Maybe he will, more, he will respect more religious people from now on. Maybe he will not be so progressive in his liberalism and his hate for religion. Maybe some people that today sent to jail with no hesitation now he will think twice because now this film is going to make an impact on him. I have a cousin that was a judge for many years in Haifa, in the same court. Haifa is a very liberal city, some say even worse than Tel Aviv. 
So, he is also a lefty, he's also liberal, because his wife is like that. She's a doctor and her father was a judge and they are the heart of the liberals. So he became like his wife for all these years. It wasn't like that 30 years ago. When we grew up together, we cousins. We grew up together. We used to listen to the same music, exchanging records. He became a judge. So, although he's 100% wicked according to Torah, because every liberal person is wicked, but at least he had one thing about him that is an honest person, meaning if you make a point, he either admit or he say, I don't have the tools to argue with you about it. I'm not knowledgeable. I remember arguing with him about religion like 27 years ago, in my beginning, and he stopped me and he said, look, what is the point of me arguing with, arguing with you? I'm not knowledgeable in Torah. So I don't have the kelim, en li ta kelim lit modded itcha. That's his words. I don't have the tools to debate you. He didn't say, oh, you primitive, you this, you that, you radical, you know, like the rest of the liberals. He say, I'm limited. I have no knowledge in Judaism. You make me saying things are impressive. I don't I have no idea. Maybe you're right. One time, he had, I saw on the news that a bunch of Hasidim that demonstrate when they go with the tractors to make a highway, they want to pave the highway on graves, ancient graves, Jewish graves with Mag and David on the graves. When they started to dig, they found a cemetery. Nobody knew about it from hundreds of years ago. Right away, religious people run. They lay on the floor. They beat them up. Why they, why they, what do they have to do with these dead people? Because they know the Torah say you have to watch the dignity of the dead. You cannot uh, disrespect the bodies or the grave. So they lay down, the police arrested them. Hasidim. Now they come to his courtroom tomorrow to decide if to extend the arrest or to send them home with bail until the trial. He can say they stay in jail. How long? Until next week, they see a judge. Or you can let them go home with, I don't know, $100 bail or anything. Or you can also dismiss the case. He has the power. So I say to him, just imagine now, after they buried your father, his father was a great man, that your father is in a grave, and now they want to make a highway on your father's head. They open his grave, they smash his skull. They're about to make a highway in your father's grave. And this Hasidim came and they lay down and they broke their bones because they want to defend your father. Instead of you doing it, they ran to get beaten up to save the dignity of your father. People like this are righteous or they deserve to sit in jail? The next day, he sent them all home. Without me telling him that, for sure he would extend their things. The police wants to extend the arrest. Usually the judge accepts the request. Right away, send them home. Found the reason and he sent them home. I have no doubt that it is only because of that. And the one who gave me the idea to speak to him was his mother. Otherwise I wouldn't know about it. She told me tomorrow is a case, I think 17 Hasidim. And if he's going to arrest them, who knows what's going to be the end? They can put them in jail for a long time for fighting police people. It's not a problem. You go, for, you fist fight with police, you can get arrested for months. It just shows you that in the end, it all comes down to knowledge. The more knowledge you gain, the more tools you have to change. It doesn't mean you will change, because if you're evil and you are Erev Rav, you will not change. Because the Torah already told us this Erev Rav are evil, they'll never change. And they are the one who will control the world before the end. And we see in Israel what they do every day. But not all of them are Erev Rav. So our job is to try here and here and here, and maybe he's not Erev Rav and we'll save him. And maybe she's not and we'll save her. Most of them are Erev Rav. There's nothing you can do about it. The Gaon Vilna said they are the worst of all 
exiles we ever had. Worse than the Romans and the Greeks and the Philistines and all of that. The Ramchal continue. The Ramchal says Hashem makes a limit to how much impurity the world can stand. For instance, when they reached that limit, he had to bring flood 4,200 years ago and kill all the people in the world. And restart the world from Noah and his family. Why? Because the, the world, it's called Igdisha Taseah. The sins of all the wicked people in the world reached the top of the container. There is no more place to hold the sins. The world must come to an end. Either a massive tragedy when millions will die, like a plague or pandemic, or a complete wipeout and restart of the world as it happened. And we saw it, it happened. So, like it happened in the time of the flood, the Ramchal says. But he will restart the world, but not destroy the world. That's the limit that Hashem set. Otherwise, the world cannot go on. And even in that, there are different levels. For instance, a person wants to give his life for the sake of heaven. I want to sacrifice my life for you, God. If he's willing to do it, he didn't do it. He's willing to do it. In the end, it didn't work out. They didn't kill him. They could have killed him. In the end, they say, oh, you're crazy. Just go home. Bow down to our idol, or we chop your head off. Shema Israel, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, Hashem, I'm going to die for you. Put his head down. I leave him alone. It's, it's crazy. Yalla, go home, go home. We're not killing you today. He got a full reward. Just like they chop his head off. Something like this will bring huge light to his soul and to the entire creation, to the entire world, and to the nation of Israel. Someone that in his mind is hoping that one day he will die on Kiddush Hashem, like Rabbi Akiva did for 80 years, until it happened to him in the end. 80 years he was thinking every day when he said, Shema Hashem, when will you give me the merit to die for the sake of your holiness? And in the end, when it happened, he stood and told him, Rabbi Akiva, you can say the name of Hashem and all of them will die, these Romans. Why you let them torture you? That's when he said, all my life I waited for this moment, I finally have this test, I'm going to let it go. And anyway, he was 120 years old. So if he would get saved today, he would die tomorrow. Either way, there's not that much time to, left anyway. There is a question, they ask Rav Eliashi, someone that is 119 years old, should you tell him, Ad mea v'esrim? It could be an insult. So why? Ma, you want me to die in a few months? <laughs> I'm 119 and four months. You tell me Ad Mea Vesrim, that means you, you wish me to die in, uh, in eight months. <laughs> so what should you do? <laughs> That's it. That's the answer of Ravel Yashi. So you should live long life. Long. As long as Hashem wants. Top. Someone that in his mind is willing to give his life, it also brings light, not as much as in action, but it also brings lights to the world. More holiness comes down, thanks to that willingness of that person to give his life. So we see that the general first rule of Shema Israel is first, testimony that God is the boss and is one, admitting that there is no one like him, accepting his kingdom on me, and willing to die for his holiness. Let's repeat. If you didn't do it until now, you have a very serious defect every time you say Shema Yisrael. So you might as well do it right. First, Hashem is one. He is the ruler of everything. Without him there's nothing. Right? On all the creation. And I am ready as a faithful soldier to give my life for his sake in any given moment. So it's actually three. 
Hashem is one, He rules everything, and I'm willing to die for you, Hashem. Three things when you say Shema Yisrael. When you put your head down, Baruch Shem Kvod Malchuto Laolam Vaed, that's what you have to have in mind. Once you do that, it makes the evil power surrender a little more, and a little more, and a little more. In your life, and generally in the world. And it brings more blessing to the creation. You may think, who am I to, in, to affect the whole world? You are very important. Because the Torah said that saving a life of one Jew counts like you save the whole world. That's what the Torah said. כל המציל נפש אחת מישראל. רבי יוסף קארו, that wrote Shulchan Aruch 500 years ago, he wrote that all his life he had a dream that the Spanish, Portuguese, Christian that used to kill a lot of Jews and force them to become Christian, they will come to him and will kill him al kiddush Hashem. He was hoping to, to choose death over going against God's truth. But he did not force it because he had something more important to do. It's to write Shulchan Aruch and merit the public and teach them Torah and make them more righteous. Because someone who teach Torah is the most important person in the whole world. Higher than prophets that you read about them in the Tanakh. That's what Chovot HaLevavot say. I wrote the whole paragraph in my last lecture that I gave in Great Neck. Whole thing, word by word. And someone who makes people return to religion, that's even greater by far than someone who just teach Torah. Because he does both. He teach Torah, plus he makes Baal Tshuva. Nothing comes near this kind of people. So, that's why Rabbi Yosef Karo gave up his dream. Because all, all he has to do is to come in front of this kitchen and get on their nerve and they would chop his head off. Like they did to Rab Molcho. There was one uh, that they forced his family to turn into Christianity. And he was rebelling against the family and showed that he stayed a Jew. And they used to warn his family, they were very rich. Your son gets on our nerve, discipline him. And he refused. He was waiting until they executed him in the public, in front of all the cheering Christians. How they used to torture Jews. Today we see the Hamas, we see all these evil people. Most of us have no idea that the Christian is a thousand times more cruel than them. What you saw in a, in a Holocaust, you saw it. But the Holocaust was not necessarily because of Christianity. Even not religious uh, Nazis hated Jews and wanted to torture them. Not because of Christianity. Hitler in Machimo wrote in his book that the reason we have to kill all the Jews because they are communist, socialist, and they are anti-God and they made the communist revolution in Russia and they will bring their liberalism to Germany and because of that they will destroy us. So we have to kill them before they will destroy us. Of course they don't teach you in a secular schools in Israel that the Holocaust happened because the secular communist Jews like Bernie Sanders brought it on us. This they won't teach you over there. They won't. Why? Because then the religious people will come and say, what do you, how do you dare to talk? Because of you, millions of us died. And you have the nerve to open your mouth. They don't want attacks. So that part, they hid. I myself did not know it until a year or two ago. When Rav Yosef Ben Porad started to read in his speech, parts from his book, Hitler's book, word by word in Hebrew, explaining why he wants to kill the Jews. They turned against God. There was one more reason. They are loan sharks. They kill the goyim with interest. 10, 20, 30% interest a year. That's another reason. Rabotai, see what's going on over here. The Ramchal continue. Oh. 
Once we finish Ma, meaning we accept that there is one God, we accept that he's ruling on everything, and we accepted the fact that we're willing to die for him, there is one more tikkun over here. When we put the head down, we say, Baruch Shem Kvod Malchuto Le'olam Va'ed. That the, the kingdom and the ruling of Hashem will remain for eternity. Le'olam Va'ed. Forever and ever. That's a fourth thing you have to think. Not just that he's the one, and not just that he's the king of everything, and not just that I'm a servant and willing to die for him in any given moment. I acknowledge and declare that his kingdom is not temporary, God forbid. It's eternal. For us, it sounds uh, obvious. It's uh, rhetorical. No, no. Even if you know it, even if it's in your head, even if you do not question it one minute of your life, the more you repeat it in words and in your mind, the more holiness comes into your soul. The more blessing comes to the world, even if it's obvious. And David HaMelech told us the secret. Emanti ki adaber. You know why I'm such a great believer in God? Although I have such horrible life with so many tragedies and so much suffering, no one had a harder life than King David besides Yaakov Avinu. He's the only one. Those two, those two holy legends, Jacob and David, had the most difficult life a human being can have. You can add Eov to that. Eov. Terrible life. Chase, his own son wants to murder him. Shaul wants to kill him. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible life. And what does he say in Tehilim? And Hashem puts his stamp on it. Emanti ki adaber. You know why I'm such a great believer? Because that's all I talk about. Faith, faith, emunah, bitachon. There's no one but Hashem. Enod milvado. When you make a bracha, you want to make a bracha? Here I am going to make a bracha. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Sheakol Nia Bidvaro. What does it mean? Bless you, God, the King of the Universe, Sheakol Nia Bidvaro, that everything happens with His world. He says, should be light, there's light. Should be darkness, there'll be darkness. There should be a war, there'll be a war. Should be COVID pandemic, there'll be COVID pandemic. There'll be Holocaust, there'll be Holocaust. Nobody can do anything about it. All he has to do is to say a word. And that's the end of it. Every second the worlds are moving and the galaxies, it's also his world. Every day Hashem renewed the creation. We could have put an end to it. But you have to think in your mind, not just to say bracha. You have to think. Everything is... When they used to want, when they wanted to execute big rabbis, they said, what's your final wish? Give me a glass of water. <laughs> it's going to chop his head off in a second, these this Nazis. He needs no water. What happens if you die thirsty? Are we going to feel tears? No. In one minute you'll be dead. Who cares about the war? No, you fool. I need water. I want to say thank you, God. Everything happened from you. It's nothing random. I want the last words of my life to say, I accept it 100. No doubt. Do you know what a difference it is to die? Saying, Shakol Nia Bidvaro, or Shema Israel, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, or to just die, to die and say, oh, oh, my, oh, mama, mama, save me. And I had to talk about, oh, JC. JC couldn't save himself. You want him to save you, you fool. You know how he was begging the Romans, please, why are you hanging me here? The Ramchal say, the angels, with their territory, praising Hashem every day. They have shifts. 
What do they say? Baruch Shem Kvod Malchuto Olam Vaed. That's why we say it quietly. Because that's the language of the angels. The people don't deserve to praise Hashem. When you think about it, a mouth that speaks so much Lashon Hara, cursing, lies, heresy, all of a sudden wants to praise God? Come on, what's this hypocrisy? Even if someone insists to do it, what can I do? I have only one mouth. That's what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai say. Hashem, you should have made two mouths. One for every day and one for holiness, for praise and Torah. Hashem say one mouth you cannot control. You want to have two mouths, they would fight all day. Imagine you walk on the street, you have one mouth here and one mouth here. All day fighting, cursing each other. Why? One of them is religious, one of them is secular. One is a righty, one is a lefty. One support Trump, one support Sleepy Joe. Imagine what fights you will have on the street. You'll have to stay in the house and nobody hears. Why? One mouth for Torah, it's holy mouth. The other mouth, Hashem Yerachem. So, what happens if a person insists to praise Hashem? Lo shora alem shechina karaui. You don't get this, the influence, the spirit of Hashem on you as the way it should be. Yaakov Avinu was very holy. Before he passed, he said, Shema Israel, and all his sons answer, Baruch Shem Kvon Malchuto Olam Vaed. There was a huge impact on the world, not like us. <laughs> the boy says, Shema Israel, and Yaakov answer, Baruch Shem Kvon Malchuto Olam Vaed, meaning, thank God that all my children are religious. None of them went off the path. So Baruch Hashem, we have an understanding about this, the whole concept of Shema. Let's talk, a little, let's talk about prayers a little bit, something we have to do every day. The concept of praying is one of the obligations that Hashem ruled in His creation. That all the creations, meaning people, receive blessing from Him based on how much they pray. The more they pray, the more merits they get. The more they pray, the more their soul is waking up to serve and follow the instructions. The more energy you get, positive energy. And you get closer to Hashem, every prayer makes you closer by something to Hashem. you never be the same. Now, or after we're going to pray, when we finish Tfilah Tarvit, that Tfilah makes you a little bit closer to Hashem. And a little bit closer, and a little bit closer, and also closer to what you are asking for. And according to how much we are awakening to serve and to get closer to Hashem in holiness, that's how He reflects to us. So it's a two-way street. If we won't have this awakening, he won't send us the, the wealth, spiritual wealth, physical wealth. And there's nothing Hashem wants more than to benefit people. That's why he created us. So he prepared for us a tool or a channel to get almost everything we want, everything that is good for us. And what are we doing? Neglecting that ability. Ah. I pray three years, nothing happened. You fool, what do you think? You're going to go like this and everything you want will come right away? Whoa, that's not how it goes. Pray with devotion, with good intention. We learned from Moshe Rabbeinu that prayed 515 times to enter Israel. When he was about to start his 516th prayer, Hashem had to stop him. Enough! Do not add another word about it to me. All the commentaries explain 
that the next prayer, Hashem will be forced to cancel the decree that Moshe would not enter the Holy Land. He would be forced to let him in. Why? Because there's nothing that can stand in the, against the power of prayers. And every prayer, you get another inch, and another one, and another one, until you reach the target. And Moshe was 99.9% .9 there. One more, and boom. And it happens. And that's when Hashem told him, don't do it. And Moshe said, why? Even send me as a bird, as a cow, as an animal, let people eat my meat. It's, at least I walked in the holy land. Hashem said, you have enough. What do you have? What does mitzvot that only you can do in Israel? You cannot do in a, in a desert, in the exile. Give me a week. Let me do the mitzvot of Eretz Israel, trumot, ma'asrot, things that only in the holy land, and then take me. I'm not asking for another 50 years of life. Not even a year of life. Not even a month of life. Give me a week or two. And Hashem say, you have plenty, don't worry. What does, what does it mean? You are the rabbi of all the people. They are entering Israel. Everything they're going to practice, go anyway to your account. So you will have plenty of mitzvot from the Holy Land. Don't worry. Your children do it. Your students do it. It goes into your account. What are you so worried about? But we learn from here that one more davening, one more prayer, and it will be all changed. And then Moshe would enter Israel and Hashem would be forced to bring the Mashiach. That's it. It will be the end of everything. So Hashem actually wanted to enforce his punishment by forcing him to stop praying. What do you care? Let him pray five million times. You can tell him, Moshe, you're wasting your time. I already told you, you and Aaron cannot enter Israel. You can talk and talk as much as you want. You're wasting your time. I made up my mind. And that's it. Let him continue to pray. What do you care? It's his choice. Give him reward for speaking to Hashem and counting on Hashem. But you don't have to accept his request. But from here we see that Hashem must accept the request. Must. And because he didn't want to be in that position, he forced him to stop praying. He didn't ignore him. He just forced him to stop praying. It's a very big difference. When you tell someone you can pray until, until next year, nothing is going to change. You're fired and that's it. Or you can say, don't, don't pray. Why do you care that I pray? Don't pray. I told you you're not, you not entering. But why are you telling me not, not to pray? Because when you pray, I have to change my verdict. That's the power of prayers. So that's an honor to stand and praise Hashem and make the request and thank Him and be, uh, have gratitude. And that's called ishtadlut, effort, making an effort. Hashem is interested to open an opening for every human being to get close to Him. That's His desire. He wants it all the time, to anyone. But obviously a person has to earn that opening. Not everyone gets it. Even though the person naturally now is very far from the light and is very deep into the darkness, Hashem still gives him permission to stand in front of him with his evil mind, with his evil actions, with his filthy mouth, with his filthy head, with all the horrible things he does. Stand in front of Hashem and he record and, and accept every one of his words. Do you know another king that will agree such a thing? You tell me. Anyone would agree such a thing? Even to get pardon from the President of the United States, you have to have so many levels and requests and efforts and pay money and this and connection until he will consider your case. He would let a, a, a serial killer come and stand in front of him with his, with his orange pyjama. Mr. President, I killed 60 people. Can you send me home? Who gave him permission to enter? How does he even talk to me? Ah, you're the president, we understand. But Hashem has no problem that this serial killer will speak to him. And the rapist and the pedophile and the thief, and that's something un unheard of. 
You don't have it anywhere else besides Hashem. And that's when Hashem opens for this person an opening, meaning a path, to elevate himself from the low level he's in. And that's the importance of the tefillah. And what's the, pur the purpose? A person put his head down and walk back three steps. I'm going back to where I came from. I surrender, I put my head down. I understand I'm nothing and I was able to elevate myself for a few minutes. Some people are in a rush to finish quickly. 15 seconds, they finish. You start. Hashem, Sfatai, Tiftar. Baruch, Ata Hashem, Magen Avram. He's already in Modim. You finish. Baruch, Ata Hashem, Ha'el HaKadosh. Right away, sit down and play with his phone. 15 seconds. Take him to a competition in Hebrew. Tell him, let's see how you read that Filat Shmona Yisra in 15 seconds. Nobody can read it less than two and a half minutes, even if you talk like a machine gun. You know the people in the auction? Did you ever go to the auction when they sell cars? You don't understand one word. I asked that one time, I went with a dealer to buy a car 25 years ago in Pennsylvania. So the guy, I said, what, do you understand what he said? Well, he took me a year. <laughs> you know how fast they talk? Even if he talks like that, he won't finish Monastery in less than two and a half minutes. Ne nevertheless, that these prayers have zero meaning. Who wants to stand in front of the king of universe and show him what a burden it is that I have to meet with you every day for a few minutes? And expect that the prayers will be accepted. I don't know why these people come to shul for. I'm still trying to understand that. And you know what's the worst part? When the davening finish, they stand outside in a parking to, st to talk to people for 20 minutes. Ah, I thought you were in a rush. It's nothing to do with rush. And it's nothing to do with the time. It's, just, it's a burden. Ki lo oti karata Yaakov ki yagata bi Israel. There's a verse about it. You do not actually call me Jacob. You are tired. Tired of, of me, Israel. You come to request things, showing me how much you suffer, that you have to talk to me? It's a shame. That's what I say, people arrive to the whale after a month in the desert, they're about to die any minute, now they have an opportunity to drink and to fill up their containers, and what do they do? Smoke a cigarette. <laughs> On the side. What are you doing? Take advantage, you have water. No rush. No rush. No rush until he dies. So, Abotai, when Hashem gave control to the evil power and permission to expand in the world because the people choose to be evil and wicked, the darkness in the world is on a rise. Even when a person goes to sleep, this impurity of the sins of all the people in the world is landing on him when his soul leaves the body. Because when we go to sleep, a part of our soul goes up to the court of heaven to sign for everything we did wrong that day. When a part of the soul leaves, we are one sixtieth of a dead person. Meaning, we are similar, partially, to someone who died completely. That's why we have to wash our hands before touching anything in the morning because of the bad spirit. Bad spirit can only come on someone that was pure and became impure. How you bring yourself back to purity? You have to wash the hands like the al say first thing in the morning. What brings this impurity to a person that is asleep? All the sins that are happening in the world bring spiritual darkness. And the more sins, the more powerful is that bad spirit. And the impurity is traveling all over the world.
The Gemara in Masechet Brachot, page 57, said what I just said, Shena echad mishishim bemita. Sleeping is 1.6% from death. It's a little bit of a taste of death. For that's when the darkness is growing at night. Night is a time of judgment. That's why when we go to sleep and sunset, or when they used to go to sleep when the stars comes out, because there's no electric. Everyone goes to sleep and wake up at midnight to learn Torah. So between sunset and midnight, that's where the judgment is very, very strong in the world. After midnight, it's the second, night, second half of the night, it turns into mercy. So when a part of the soul is not in the body to purify it spiritually, that's when there is permission to the impurity to enter the body and to lay on it. And that's what the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, page 108, talks about the impurity on the hands. Why from all the parts in the body, the impurity goes on the hands? Why not in the head? Why you don't have to rinse your head? Why in the hand? The answer is on the hands and on the feet. Why? That's why we have nails. What's the connection? Nails, it's a memory of what, or what Adam used to be. Adam was a giant and it was all made from nails, meaning there's no skin, no wrinkles, no injections, no, nothing is necessary. Why? Shine like a diamond. Shine like a diamond. After the scene, he became what he became, and that's what we are. Smaller and limited, and only something left to remind us what we used to be before the scene. As results of that, the impurity power of the, of the sins and the Satan is anti-holiness. And what reminds them who he is to be? This area. So that's where they come right here. Same thing a pregnant woman, when she walks in the street, if she walks over someone that cut his nails and throw them on the floor, she can have a miscarriage on the spot and lose her baby. Why? Because the impurity power remains on the nail even when you cut them. And if you walk over it and they see an angel is teaching the baby nine months in a stomach Torah, they go crazy. If you saw the woman from Dimona in Israel 25 years ago when she had a dibuk, her husband died from alcohol poisoning, and then his soul entered her body. And from her mouth, he was talking. Her husband was talking from the mouth of his wife in the voice of a man, just like it was when he was alive. You have it on video, you can see it. And when the, all the Kabbalists came with the shofars and started to say, Yoshev Beseter Elyon, that's Teilim, that's able to kick out the bad spirits. Lots of people have bad spirits in them. The way to remove it is a certain ceremony. So when they told her to read the Teilim, he was moving her hands, not letting her read. Remember, he's in the body, he can move the parts of the body just like she can. It's like two captains are fighting on a plane. Who's gonna take over the wheel? Stick. He wasn't letting her read. You had to see how he was moving the tailin that she won't be able to read because he went crazy. Because they cannot stand holiness. The Gaon Mivilna, when they used to bring in people that start to talk with themselves, they have bad spirits, he took the holy Zohar, the Kabbalah, and put it on their head. As soon as he did it, he used to scream, ah, take it away. One time, the Gaon Mivilna say, you have a Zohar here? Say yes, they brought it. He put it on the head of the person, and he was laughing. Ha, 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 you think you can scare me with this Zohar? The Gaon Mivilna said, how can it be? He's supposed to go crazy when I put the holy book on his head. He said, how can it be that you're not scared of the Zohar? According to the rules of Hashem, when I put the Zohar, you have to go crazy from suffering. He said to him, because this Zohar was printed on Shabbat, has zero holiness in it. 
We understand Rabotai? Everything is much, much, much deeper than what you used to think. Think again. Time is running out and I have to finish this series, so let's rush. So the first thing is to purify the hands. Why? The bad spirits in on them. So you have to rinse six times. Three and three. One, the left has to serve the right. Left is judgment, right is mercy. So you fill up with the right, move to the left. The left spill on the entire palm from the wrist all the way. And you turn your hands that it goes all over. And then left, right, left, right, left. All together six. According to the Zohar, it's better to do eight. Four and four. Halacha, three and three. Why don't we rinse the legs? Well, you know, the Arabs, when they go to the mosque, they bring their dress up. They took, put their hands inside by the faucets and they rinse their legs. Why? Because in, in Bet HaMikdash, they used to do all these things, the Kohanim. Today, there is no power to remove the impurity from the legs. They don't know it, so they waste their time. Muhammad, where are you? I'm washing my legs. Wash for a million years, you can't get rid of anything. But the hands, we still remove. By the legs, there's no, that's why we don't touch the legs. If you touch the leg, you have to right away go and do netila on your hands. Even if you go to the mikveh, and you came out, and you touch your legs, you still need netila. Even if the legs are not dirty, they don't have sweat, they don't have sand. You just touch the legs, you have to do the tila. That's why make sure you don't touch your legs. If you dress, you touch the, the pants, no problem. But if you touch the skin, the tila. What happens if you don't have water? So you go like this on your clothes, like this. That also helps. Not as much as water, but also. If you have sand, you can dip your hand in sand, like beach sand or something, also good. But the best thing, obviously, is water. To remove impurity, water. That's why conversion can never take place unless the person, the, the goy, goes completely into the water. If one hair left out, the conversion is, is not kosher. Why? Because the bad spirits still hold to that hair and then spread to the rest of the body when they come out of the mikveh. Sometimes when we do conversion, the goy or goya, they don't go enough into the water. The head stays a little bit above the water. What happens if you have uh, scabs, scabs, like wounds? Scabs, right? Scabs or, or a band-aid or something, it's also not good. Or a sticker. Why? Because every, every dot of the body must re re receive the water together. If one place stays dry, then the impurity is still there and it spreads to the rest of the body. We are talking spiritual impurity, not dirt. If a woman just came out of a shower with all her creams and perfume, she rinsed herself a million times, she's 100% impure. She needs to go into the water after Nida or, or a Goyana wants to become Jewish. It has nothing to do with the cleanness of the body. We are talking complete spiritual thing, even if the water are dirty. Let's say a thousand people went into that mikveh. The water is already dirty. It's not clean. They need to purify the whole system like a swimming pool. It takes a day or two. They need to put chlorine and the pumps have to circle the water and clean it. It doesn't matter. The water are not clean. You go in and out, you become pure. Then take a shower. Get rid of the dirty water. You can have the most clean water that came from a faucet and does not remove the impurity because it's water that came with the pump. It has to be natural. The Torah says water that went into the hole naturally, like rainwater, spring water, lake, ocean. If you move the water from one place to another, they don't have the ability to remove the impurity. See, this is all divine rules that nobody knows why. Only Hashem knows. But he told us what makes the difference and what doesn't. So, there are two parts in a, in a human being that the neshama there are in more control. The brain and the heart. The brain and the heart are the two most important organs. 
First, the spiritual divine light goes into the brain, which is the head, which is in control of the entire body. Once it affects the soul that is in the head, in the brain, then it spreads to the heart. That's the concept of putting tefillin on the hand and on the head to bring that spiritual influence to those two places, the heart and the soul. And it helps to purify the place. Of course, you don't want to just buy cheap tefillin because maybe it's not even kosher. Or, ve or even if it's kosher, it's a very low level. It's very, qu it's questionable. Today they make tefillin with lots of shortcuts. Those shortcuts did not exist in the time of Moses. So you always remain in a certain doubt. Maybe your tefillin is not the way Hashem expected to be. Because by God, every little thing makes a difference. That's why I bring the most important, highest level of tefillin on earth, which is 100% handmade, no electric use, no glue, no shortcuts, no machines, all by hand. Highest level of leather, highest beauty, completely, in a, you cannot get anywhere in the world higher than this. No exaggeration, I said in front of a camera. It takes five times longer to make. Without, with all the shortcuts, makes saves you many, many hours. And the highest level of sofer, holy, ben Torah, talmid chacham, mikveh every day, no smartphone, none of these things, doesn't know what internet is, nothing. 100% holy. Not just holy when he learns Torah, holy in every second of his life. Feeling like this should have been a million dollars, no exaggeration. That's really what they want, a million dollars. Today by the Hasidim, by the Ashkenazim, you buy ordinary Mehudar Tfilin, six, seven thousand dollars. Just now I deliver one pair of Tfilin to one Bukharian guy in Forest Hills before I got here. He told me I have a Satmer Hasid partner. He just bought tefillin for his son's bar mitzvah, five and a half thousand dollars. I told him it doesn't even reach 10% of the one I just bought you. And you paid less than two thousand dollars. Nothing to compare. Why? Because when you go to, first of all, you can't get it in store, because the store doesn't want to store such tefillin. Because most people don't go for the best in the world. They go, they buy, what do you have the cheapest? This, ah, get me this one. The store cannot store uh, 50 pairs of tefillin like this. That's a very special order, and it's also hard to get. You need to know who you get it from, you have to know the person. It's not that, believe me, it's very hard. It's not like a car. You know what you get. Every part is already determined what you put in a car. All of them are the same. This is all handmade, it's not the same. You need to know where you get it. And this is life and death. All the holiness of your life, besides parnasa and happiness, they have a machine in Israel that showed the aura of the body. The aura. There is a special machine. All of us has a special aura around them with different colors. White is the best. Red is bad. It has a different color. When, they, when a person has not feeling very bad aura. Once he put feeling, the aura immediately changed. The machine shows you immediately. It's scientific, no argument. The aura changed completely. But they put non-kosher feeling. One letter was missing. The aura didn't change. You cannot get approximately good. No, it's not. No. In the car, you're missing one window. No, not the end of the world. The tires are not originally like it was. You put cheap tire, no, not the end of the world, it still drives. You don't have the best car seat, no, not the end. Of, the stereo is not so great, no big deal. One speaker doesn't work, way to survive. Sunroof doesn't open, we'll survive. Feeling, no, no. One leather is missing, it's nothing. It's a piece of leather. You have to see that video. You have to see it. Then you have zero doubts after that to know that Torah is one million percent divine. You put garbage bag on your head, the Ura won't change. You put the New Testament on your head, the Ura becomes worse. Test it, no joke. You put the tefillin on, 
the entire Ura changed. Rav Mordechai Eliyahu, alav ha-shalom, before he passed, they met a series of tests putting different feelings on him. I had to see this video. They told Rav Mordechai Eliyahu, okay, we took off that feeling, the Ura changed. We want you to make Yehudim, Kabbalistic intention, intention in your mind. Kabbalistic Yehudim. He started to have in his mind the names of Hashem, all kinds of things. And the Ura immediately changed to white again. Unbelievable. What else do you want? What else do you want? Read the New York Times, see what happened to your Ura. Look at the face of Bernie Sanders, the Ura become black. Just from looking at his lousy face. Shem Reshaim Irkav. Rabotai, what else do you want? What, how many more proofs? So Rabotai, after a person is covered with a little feeling, and he stands in front of Hashem and begin to travel in the world, starting in Olam Briya and now Olam, Olam Yetzira, and then Olam, first Olam Asiya, then Olam Yetzira, then Olam Briya, then he goes up to Olam Atzilut. Then you have the Kedusha, then you have the Birkat Kohanim, which is mitzvah from the Torah. And all the spiritual greatness is falling on you non-stop, Baruch Hashem. The first part of the prayers is sacrifices. Then Zimra, praising Hashem with Psalms. And then Kriyat Shema and the blessing before and after. And then Amida. There are four worlds, lower, higher, higher and highest. That's how it goes. Atzilut, Briya, Yetzira, Asiya. I once gave a lecture about it. The sacrifices is this world, what you do with your hands. You bring animals to the sacrifice, you slaughter, it's all reincarnation of different kinds of people. That's big secrets about the sacrifices. Today we don't have Beta Mikdash, none of that applies. So what do we do? We read the sacrifices, the parts in the Torah that talks about it. It counts like we actually sacrifice in a holy temple. Then we have Tzuket Zimra. It brings, it's revealing the light of Hashem. When we praise Him, we talk about His praises. That's with songs. That's a very big thing in the eyes of Hashem. Then we have the blessing of Kriyat Shema and the Kriyat Shema itself. Right? And as we just explained that Hashem is one and is the ruler and we're willing to give our life for him and his ruling is eternal and will never end and will never be limited. Also Hashem decreed that all the people that get the greatness from him first will be connected here in this world and then will open the effect from the upper world. So the roots are all in heaven. Just like here you have a root, you have the, the stem of the tree, then you have the branches, and then you have the leaves and the fruits. From the upper world is the upside down. The root is there and it comes down like a big pipe and then begin to spread to the world with the branches and then falls on the individual, which is the fruits or the leaves. It's very interesting how it works. The upper world, the world of the angels is millions and millions of angels, big amount. All the way up to the Olama Atzilut, like they, like they said, the chair of Hashem, Kisei HaKavod. And over there, they praise Hashem non-stop with different ships, shifts. And it's robotic over there. They obviously, automatically, and their holiness is beyond words. This is where the prophet went up to the upper world and described what he saw there. And that's what we do in the Kedusha, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. That's, that's what the angels do. Based on that, the prayers is divided to three different sections. 
This world, the world of the angels, and the world of Kisei HaKavod. This world, Korbanot, praises, singing, Kriyat Shema, and standing in front of Hashem in Tefillat Shmona Yisrael, that's this world. And after that, we have the, what we, the, the Leviim, the Levites used to sing and play music in Bet HaMikdash. And the Ramchal continue, and the Ramchal say, after that, we have another important part, which is the confession. Hashamnu, Bagadnu, the list of all the sins we commit. It's very important to, to express those words in your mouth for your ear to hear. Because when a person speaks and his ear listens, it's engraved in your neshama. If you only think about it, it's less power. That's why when you want to remember something, when you will learn by yourself, you have to read the words loud. And if you want to remember even more, you sing the words. Sometimes you go into yeshiva in the lunch break or something and I see a few guys sitting there and singing the Gemara with tune. Why they sing? Because when you sing, the brain does never forget the melody. That's why if I have to let you remem memorize a song, someone made a song, I give you the words on a piece of paper, you will have to repeat it 50 times until you remember, or maybe a hundred times. But if I let you hear the song three, four, five times, you'll be able to sing the entire song. How can it be? Five times and you remember all the words. Hundred times you read it, Re read it without melody. You don't remember everything. Because this is the way Hashem made the world. When you sing, you go to a spiritual world which is almost as high as the Torah world in the heavens. That's what the Gaon Mivilna say. The, the Torah world is the highest and the music comes almost as high. And as brilliant in music. Brilliant. Endless brilliant. It's like a prophecy. Imagine someone, it's like the spirits of Hashem goes on someone and all of a sudden he composed the nicest music that people listen to a thousand, thousand years. When the soul of King Saul was low, he used to call David to play for him violin and uh, uh, what do you call that? Oh, thank you. Yeah, he, every time he was depressed, thank you. Every time he was depressed, King David had to come play music for him. Music elevate the soul. That's why when you go to places of Hasidim that love to pray, they will say the Hallel 40 minutes with songs. Not like people who say it five minutes and run. They sing and sing and sing. You can go home, eat breakfast and come back and they're still in the Hallel. Why? They enjoy to pray. They feel the holiness of the neshama is elevated by the minute. Next to my house, there is a shoe like this. They come 8.30 in the morning, 12.30, they come out on Shabbat. Why? They love to pray. Almost everyone there is a dig at all. People that love Torah, love to pray, love Hashem, they live by the book, 100%. They enjoy to pray. See, the rabbi is holy. It reflects on the entire community. You, you, you feel the presence of holy people standing with you in a room. You feel it. Just like you feel the filth of these liberals, these wicked people. When you come in a place with them, you want to vomit. If you don't feel it, that means you are very impure. You should know it. Holy people cannot be near them in a room. Cannot be near them. One uh, rabbi came to visit us on Shavuot in Monsi. Big chacham. The chavrut of the chief rabbi. Brilliant speaker also. Very smart, very smart person. <laughs> so we learned a lot this entire Shavuot non-stop. Day, night. It was beautiful. So he said that uh, when he was young, a child, a teenager, his rabbi said, look at the eyes of Rav Yitzchak Kaduri. He was the oldest Kabbalist. He was a hundred years old back then. Look, stare in his eyes. These eyes saw 
the Ben Ishchai in Baghdad when he was a kid. When, the, when the Rav Kaduri was 10 years old, Ben Ishchai was alive. He got a bracha from him. These eyes saw, saw the face of the Ben Ishchai. How many people in the world can say that? So, he said, one day people would say that I saw the, the eyes of, of, of Rav Ovadia and, 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 and Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul. So someone told him, you also saw the face of Bennett. He said, God forbid, if I would see him, I would faint. <laughs> That's what he answered. <laughs> Meaning I won't be able to look at him. Why? Holy person. Doesn't look at the face of people that go against Hashem. It's halacha, by the way. It's not an exaggeration. You're not allowed to look at the face of wicked people. Not allowed. It makes a very big impact on your soul, negative one. The eyes or the face? Huh? The face, the entire face. Don't look at their eyes. So what time I did that? Stare, stare. If you have glasses, you're lucky. Take it off. I did. That's it. But they took me into security. They said, look at me. I said, I don't look up. There's a woman not dressed proper here. They said, now you took me to a corner. Look at me. I want to say, I don't look at Rosh but I don't want to embarrass me. Well, if, if it comes to a situation that I tell you, look at me, you don't want to get into trouble. So you look and you think about something else. Don't stare. Look at his bald head. Focus on his forehead. <laughs> Don't look at his eyes. Eyes makes contacts. Spiritual contact. Even higher than handshakes. So Rabotai, Mamash, we're coming to the last 10 minutes of this series, with your permission. Perfect timing. Not even 10, maybe 5. We are concluding now. Ve'ulam. Whatever the level of the things would be, When a person live according to all these things we mentioned, obviously it's going higher and higher in the steps to a higher level. Every period of time he climb another step and another step and another step on the way to reach the goal. While a person does it, he occupies a lot of different battles. Meaning, while he's going towards holiness and towards purity and towards Torah knowledge and connection with Hashem and gaining divine light and all these things that we mentioned in the last eight lectures. By the way, one other thing that happens is eliminating his evil inclination and his physical desires. There is no way to overcome the natural, strong, physical desires to pleasure without Torah. There's no way. No way. Once you dip in the Torah, you have the strength to overcome any desire you can think of. Any. Money, food, women, pride, ego. Well, you name it. Without it, it's very hard. Without it, it will be almost impossible. The only rehab to all the addictions that the world has to offer is Torah. What else? Praying to Hashem with a broken heart. So the Ramchal said, all these things, Baruch Hashem, are helping a person to elevate himself another step and another step until he leaves the world. 
And obviously, the most important thing is how a person will be. What will be his rating in a moment that he leaves the world. And I will finish with a story with a story this rabbi that writes the tefillin that I was just talking about is the number one student we had in yeshiva in more than 30 years. There were more than a thousand students and without any doubt unanimously everyone you ask will tell you that he was the number one matmid addicted to Torah completely in holiness reach every title a person can reach is Afbedin, the head of the court the head of the court he's 30 years younger than the other judges when he joined the court the other rabbis went crazy who sent you here? you're a child come back in 20 years he say you can test me I'm ready test me they don't want to talk to him he has a big rabbi the rabbi called him up, he said, I'm coming to the bed din and I will give all of you a test in Choshen Mishpat. It's the hardest thing in the Torah. Laws of property, money, interest, all these things. If he will not get a higher score than all of you, throw him out. I already guarantee you, that he's going to get the highest score from all of you, that you are for years in the bedding. Because everything he does, he does it in the maximum, most perfect possible way. Became a shochet, became a moel, became a sofer, became a dayan. There's nothing that is possible to be that he didn't become. I was completely shocked when I went with him to the people that make the batet filin. It's a real real art so much so many things the people that walked there for 20 years every day did not know enough of what he was talking to them he asked them some questions they started to get confused why a legend before he moved to Israel I don't know 20 years ago he came to my house for Shabbat with his wife of course, with him, the whole Shabbat, there's no sleeping, there's no wasting time, it's only Gemara, Gemara, and Alacha, Gemara, Gemara. Whenever I go to see him, I already did dedicate three hours of my time. Even though I'm supposed to go pick up the tefillin and this, it should take five minutes, I already know it's minimum three hours. Why? Because it's like a spring. You know spring, how the water keeps coming out? Torah, Torah, you heard about this, you heard about this, Chidush, Rav Omadia, you already know it's going to be a seminar there. Why? People like this, the Torah just explodes from every place from them. <laughs> so, now he's in my house for the whole Shabbat, they're about to leave, I see, I look at his wife's face, I see she's sad. Why she would be sad? He goes to put the car seat in the car, I told her, you okay? I see that she wanted to tell me something. She said, can you speak to him? I said, what? He said, I don't know. Maybe, we, maybe he has a problem with me. I said, what? She said, yes. He doesn't look at me. He doesn't touch me. He's so into the Torah, he doesn't even acknowledge I exist. I said to him, okay, go to the car. When he comes to say goodbye, I'll talk to him. He came in. I asked him, can I ask you a question? Yeah. He said, I said to him, do you have any problem with your wife? I said, no. She's a good wife. Perfect. Sadika, great, everything. Perfect. You love her, everything. Yeah, yeah. Baruch Hashem. Hashem blessed me. So how do you explain that I just looked at her and I asked her, and please don't dare to tell her anything that she spoke to me. How do you explain that she feels that you don't even acknowledge that she exists? I will never forget that moment in my entire life. He looked at me. He said, what can I do? I'm so much into the Torah. It kills all my desires. 
I don't have any physical desire. No need for anything. I told him, you have to bring your holiness down. You have obligation. You got married, you signed on a ketubah. You have to be a human being, not an angel. No. There are people like this in our world, Rabotai. Today, today in our world. So when you have someone like this write your tefillin and you put it on your head, when I say it's worth a million dollars, maybe I underestimate it. It's worth a lot more. It's priceless. It's priceless. And that's what the Ramchal talks about. While you're going higher and higher and higher, more divine light, more divine light, more divine light goes into your soul, your entire being is occupied by holiness. And you don't care about anything, not about art, not about music, not about food, not about anything in the world. Definitely, definitely, not about sport and movies and the rest of that garbage. Holy people, you can't even talk to them a word on Shabbat about anything besides Torah. That this Shabbat, when we are in Saudash Shlishit in Yeshiva, two people spoke about the ban that they put against the angel bakeries in Israel. They put them in a ban. Nobody buys from angel. No pita, no chalas, nothing. Why? They rebel against Torah, they rebel against the rabbis. They put a lefty liberal to be the CEO of there. All the religious people stop to buy from them. Nobody touch it. All the pita breads, all the chalas, thousands of thousands, all week, now one person buy. So one person said to the other, did you see what happened to them? This, that. So there was a holy man there. Not on Shabbat. I almost fainted. Don't talk about it. Change subject. We didn't speak about a movie or about a stupid game or about work or about business or I don't know about politics. About something with the religious community. Shabbat. Change subject. Your neshama reached a level, he cannot hear it. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's mother was talking about casual things. Not non-kosher things. It was 2,000 years ago. The mother of Rashbi, the mother of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Who can even imagine what a holy woman she was, that Hashem gave her such a <laughs> legendary chacham. And he told her, Mom, Shabbat, Ima Shabbat. Don't talk, Shabbat, rak dusha, rak dusha. With the way we dress, with the way we behave, with the way we eat, with the way we learn. Shabbat. We finished Baruch Hashem, this series, in nine lectures. Every lecture was about two and a half hours approximately. We did it in around uh, 20 something hours, which is pretty good. If you read the book, whether you understand Hebrew, it will be very hard to understand. It was not easy to translate it because the language is very deep, very deep, and it's also ancient. You have to know, it's just like in English. You have technical English and you have everyday English. When you read all these contracts, there are very, very complicated uh, provisions over there to understand. You have to read 10 times to understand what really the lawmaker had in mind. Uh, 200 years ago when they wrote the Constitution. Same thing over here. It's, very, it's holy language, very deep, because these Chachamim, they speak always in a very deep language and very short. Very short. Sometimes they say in one page what it would take us 100 pages to explain. That's why we need uh, sometimes eight hours to understand six words in the Gemara, of one of the commentaries. Like the Maharsha, or Rabbi Akiva Iger, one of these, and they only lived 150 years ago, 200 years ago. Seven, eight words, eight hours to break your head until you finally break through. Why they spoke in such a short language? 
because there was, first of all, they were brilliant. So they didn't need to write a thousand words. In a few words, they got the whole thing. But not only that, there was no papers like today. You go to Staples and buy a thousand papers for 10 bucks. It was all parchment, real from the skin of the cow. Gonna remove the hair, process it, and, and write with a feather. You dip it in the ink. Do you know how difficult it was? And it's, it's expensive. When you buy mezuzah, just the cloth without the writing costs between 10 and 15 dollars. It looks like a paper. It's not a paper, it's skin of the cow. After a few process, they remove this, the, 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 the air, they make it white. You know what a process it is? And then they have to make lines until the sofer begin to write. Ooh. Very expensive. The cloth of Sefer Torah, before they write, just the cloth, the scroll, without writing, is between seven and ten thousand dollars. Just the, the cloth. Then it takes over a year to write from morning to night. Good Sefer Torah can be anywhere from thirty to seventy thousand dollars, depending on the Sofer. 304,805 letters, one by one, dip the ink and write, slow. One touch the other, you have to fix, you have to erase, it's a lot of work. Then you scan with computer, then another software, then you have to make the crowns. Oof, what a process. When the Jordanians in the war, 1948, they bombed all the synagogues of Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, and they also destroyed Porat Yosef Yeshiva. Rav Ovadia was there, Rav Ben Zion, a lot of big holy people. They destroyed more than 30 synagogues, and they stole all the Sifre Torah. One of them was a Sefer Torah that was donated by the Sasson family. It was a rich Iraqi family in business with India. They donated a Sefer Torah over a hundred years ago to the synagogue in India. Safara de Shul in India. And later they brought it from India into Jerusalem. And the Jordanian stole it. It was very old. It was from a hundred and something years ago. 120 years ago. I saw actually a picture of it. And the cover was antique, very interesting. After the war, the Jordanian captured so Israeli soldiers, and the Israelis had Jordanian soldiers. So they tried to make an exchange. So one uh, person that was sent by the Israeli government, his name was also Sassoon, different Sassoon. He went to King Hossein, the father, in his office, talking about the number of soldiers that they will give us and we will give. And then he saw the Sefer Torah in the office of King Hussein, like this on the shelf. He recognized that Sefer Torah. He told him, it was brilliant, this Sasson. He told him, oh my God, you know, there's never, they're, not, they're never gonna give such a Sefer Torah, it's worth millions. He said to him, oh my God, Wow, you're so lucky I came here. Why did you put this in your room? Don't you know it's gonna bring curse to you, to your life, to your country? You don't know. You're not supposed to put it in a private office. It's supposed to be in an ark, in a synagogue. It's not allowed to be in a house. I can show you, I can, I can send you pictures of the... You're not supposed to... Wow, 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 wow. I didn't know, I'm sorry, I didn't know. By the time he went to his van, the Sefer Torah was waiting in a van for him, and he brought it back to Jerusalem. If he would say to him, how did you dare to steal the Sefer Torah, give it back, they'll never give it. When the Americans went to Saddam Hussein treasury, do you know how many Sifre Torah and scrolls he had over there from over a thousand years ago? From the time of the, of the Tanaim and Amoraim in Babylon, it was Iraq. All the treasures, and a lot of that got damaged. The Arabs, the Goim, understand the value of the Sifre Torah. They understand the value of it. They want to keep it in their own room. And the lefty Libras wants to burn the Torah. 
together with the religious rabbis and people. That's the world we live in today. And that's what the Ramchal talked about. That the impurity will expand and expand and occupy the whole world and the darkness will take over. But it has to have a limit. Once it reached that limit, Hashem wipe out humanity. And we are very close to it. Every fool sees that the world became Sodom and Gomorrah. There's no question about it. You read what happened in the time of Sodom, it's worse now. They destroy the children, there's drug pandemic, the marriage institution is totally bankrupt, the value of the people is totally destroyed. Not all the countries are like that. Almost all countries. Besides some Arabic countries, maybe it's not as bad there. Russia. Russia is not as bad as the rest of Europe because Putin is not promoting uh, gays and all these things. But the Russian people, I'm not sure if they're better than the rest of the European. The leader doesn't allow it. In Russia, you can say that they're holier than the rest of European. I doubted that very much. But one way or the other, I'm not talking about them. That's the last of my concern. I'm talking here, America, Israel, places that relates to us. We want to be holy here. We want to live according to the rules of the Torah. And the mission only become harder and harder and harder. It becomes harder and harder. When you are religious and you go to a secular court in Israel today, to begin with, you have less than 1% chance to win. Immediately, it's a known thing that you're going to lose, regardless of how much evidence you have and how many papers you have, and everyone knows you're right. But everybody also knows that you are religious and you go to a lefty judge, and that's the end of you. And there's no justice. Here in America, it's not as bad. You may go to a liberal judge and still be fair, and, let, and if you see that you, you're right, he may, he may let you win, even if you have a yarmulke. Here, there is a little bit more democracy, real one. Now, it's not perfect here as well. The lefty destroys America, all. But they are not as bad as in Israel. In Israel, it's completely destroyed. Completely. They can look at you. They show it to you in your face. They don't hide it anymore. Until a few years ago, they were still hiding it. Now they speak like Nazis. 100% like Nazis. You drink our blood, you parasite, we don't need you here, go back to where you came from. Right in your face. You go into the elevator, they begin to curse you. You go into the parking lot, they begin to attack you. On television, on prime time, every other secular person speaks like a Nazi now. It's terrible. But it's also good news, because the masks are all coming off. And Hashem is forcing the middle to take side. Either you go towards religion and Judaism and me all the way, or totally against me. There's no 50-50 anymore. You cannot be traditional Bukharian or Moroccan or Persian. These days are over. Either you fully become Shomer Shabbat and Jewish ideology and you with the rabbis and with the Torah, or you a lefty liberal and you follow Bernie Sanders and Jack Schumer and Sleepy Joe. You must, must choose a side. In Israel, you always had 10, 20% left, 10, 20% extreme right, and the rest are all middle. There was very, very small differences between Democrats and Republicans 40 years ago. It's few minor things. Ben Gurion was a lefty. He's much more righty than any righties today you have in the government. And he was a communist. So you see the lefties 40, 50 years ago, they were not dumb. When they asked Ben Gurion about the Palestinians, he asked, who are they? There's no such thing, Palestinians. Where did they come from? Do they have a nation? Do they have an entomb? Do they have an army? Do they have represented in the United Nations? What did they have? Do we have one history books that talk about their history? One museum in the world? One document that proves that they ever existed? And until 1948, from 1948 until 1967, who controlled Gaza? Egypt. There was no Palestinian government. 
Who controlled Jerusalem? Jordan. There was no Palestinian authority. There was never Pal 1967, the Israeli occupied it. So it went from Egypt and Jordan to Israel. But there was never Palestine. Palestine is a name the Romans made to make fun of the Jews. Because they used to be Palestinians. We had nothing to do with Arabs. It was an old nation that Hashem wiped out. They wanted to get us upset. They called Israel Palest Palestina. And these crooks, these Arabs, they stole the name and labeled themselves as Palestinians. There's only one problem. They cannot say Palestinians. Because in Arabic you don't have P. So they say Palestinians. Give me one pizza with one Coca-Cola. I can't say pizza. Go to the pizza store in Israel. Ten lishne pizza. They want to say pachit pizza, pachit cola, coke of, coke can. You know what they say? Bachit. Bachit means you cried. So he comes to the girl that walks in the counter, give me bachit cola. Lo bachiti, bachit. He means a can and she thinks he say bachit, meaning cry. Two different words. They cannot pronounce their own name. Why? Because it's not their name, it's fake. So when they talk to Ben Gurion, he said, why should we compromise with them about our land? This is our land for thousands of years. They have nothing to do here. Finally, one lefty that talks like this today. So you see, Hashem is pushing the middle to an extreme side. Either you're fully religion and you're with Hashem and you're anti-gay and you're anti-corruption and you're anti all the garbage and abortion and everything they like, or you all the way with them. You pro this and pro that and pro... You see what they do in colleges, you see. Why? Because once it's clear, black and white, there's no more gray area, that's when Hashem can do the final judge, judgment. When there are people are 50-50, what are you gonna do? Destroy them, it's not fair. Give them heaven, it's not fair. That's why they are forced to take side. Either you're 100% with me or 100% against me. Don't get me wrong. No one is 100% with Hashem. Not me, not you, not anyone. Why? Because we commit sins, we have weaknesses. I'm not talking about sins that come from desire, physical desire. That's like a drug addict. He can control his desire. I'm talking ideology, ashkafa. You just ate something not kosher. You did it because you ate Hashem? God forbid. You regret that you did it? Of course. You feel horrible about it. So you are righteous who made a mistake. They don't feel bad. The opposite, you give them glad kosher steak and treif steak, on purpose they want to eat that. Those are these wicked Erev Rav. That's a lefty. Everything to get Hashem angry. To get the Rabbi angry to disrespect the religion. And I will finish with a joke that I got today, caricatura. You know how they draw these things? One lefty liberal Israeli girl, she saw a man with the yarmulke on his head, and the man was standing in one place with their yarmulkes, and the women were in the back. She said to him, excuse me, why the women are there? He said, we don't mix men and women. Don't you think it's a prejudice? It's Hadrat Nashim. You second class the women. He said to her, it's against our Quran. Oh, I'm so sorry. I hope I didn't offend you. When she thought he's a religious Jews and they separate men and women, she went crazy. It's not fair. Why you, why you separate from the women? Well, because our religion does not allow it. It's not, it's not modest. As long as it's Judaism, she will rip you to pieces. Once you say you're a Hamas terrorist, Oh, Ahmed, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't mean to offend you. I don't think, I hope you don't think I'm a racist or something. I respect very much your religion. Oh, yeah. Of course. Why should you respect Islam and not Judaism? Because Islam is fake and has nothing to do with God. There's no Yetzirah. 
The Torah is the divine word, and the Satan is pushing. Racheli, don't be fanatic. How can you stand these religious rabbis? Do you understand Rabotai or no? I hope Bezrat Hashem, please share this series. We work very hard to make it. Share it. Share it to anyone you can. You share, they share. Eventually we'll get uh, thousands of new views. It's worth it. Thank you very much. Baruch Adonai Leolam. Amen ve Amen. Rabbi Hanani Aben Akashia Omer. Ratsa Kadosh Baruch Hu Lezakot Et Yisrael. Lefichach. Irbala Em Torah Mitzvot. Shenemar.